we are going to continue in our series. If you have a Bible, I want you to open up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we are going through the book of Ephesians this summer. Uh, just kind of taking it and going chunk by chunk through this. All right. Um, and, and the book of Ephesians, as it's often called, is actually a letter. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul, uh, potentially alongside other believers, kind of co-authors speaking into it. This letter is addressed to um, the church in Ephesus. But that part, actually, the words that say to the church in Ephesus, that is, it's thought to be added in at a later time. Um, and that this probably was meant to actually be circulated among churches in Asia Minor, which uh, Ephesus would have been the capital of. Okay, and so in this letter, we see a lot of more generalized things that are being talked about instead of very specific issues that one church is dealing with. And that's what we have happen in a lot of the other letters. So we, we have this letter um, going to Ephesus. Last week, we traced some of the themes of the first chapter, and they're actually going to be up here behind me. I'm not, we're not going to do this again today. But what we did is we said, okay, when they write letters, they keep themes going through the letter. And it's important to try and trace those. This is this part of maturing as a believer. As we read scripture, we should be able to see uh, re repetitive phrases, repetitive words. Now, sometimes we miss this because it's in English. Uh, and it's actually just like hard for us because translators may take the same word in Greek, but translate it two different ways because of how it's sitting in a sentence. But these are some of the themes last week that, uh, that were in chapter 1. And we kind of traced it through the beginning of chapter 2 as we read it. And we highlighted them and said, okay, do you see these themes? And so I just want to, putting this up there just to challenge you, even as we go through today, as we go through the rest of this series, just be looking for some of these themes. There's other ones that will come up as well. Uh, but if you see that, it just kind of helps you remember, okay, Paul is trying to get something specific uh, across in that. All right, so we will be in the second half of the second chapter. Remember, chapters were added in later. That's not how Paul wrote this. This was one big letter. Um, and there are a couple verses in our section today that I'm almost, and we haven't done this yet in Ephesians, I'm almost going to kind of ignore the ones on the other side of it. And there's a couple verses I really want to drill down on. Okay, and I think that this matters for us today. So remember, the first three chapters of this letter, Paul is retelling the rescue story of God making a way for creation to be in relationship with him again. That's the first three chapters here. Okay, and all of that comes together with the cross and Jesus. Like, that's where this rescue plan really kind of takes shape. But it doesn't stop there. You know, I, I say this usually, uh, you know, surrounding Easter time. Like, on Easter, if we just celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we are actually missing a massive part of what Easter is. And that is the fact that there is a new way to live. There's now been a made way for you and I to actually have a relationship with Jesus. And we need to live that out. And so what happens here is, yes, Jesus is kind of the climax of this story, but then it absolutely continues. That's not the end, because it goes into this multi-ethnic church, this family, these followers of God. And that's kind of where we're going with this, okay? And so we have, um, we have people from all different backgrounds coming together, and this is what Paul is, is talking about. He says, this is key that you have this diversity coming together, and this is where he's going to go. And so I want us to jump in here together. Uh, if you are willing, if you're able, would you stand with me? Uh, I just want to kind of read through uh, these 11 or so verses, starting in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, today I am reading out of the NIV translation. So verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly... You who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, 
we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Lord, we pray that uh, today as we, as we read through this, and even just the thought of how many times people have gathered together and read this portion of scripture together, God, how, how many people that links us to just throughout the entire world. God, even this morning, I'm sure there's other churches that are gathering and looking at this scripture, that we would just feel, God, unified with the entire family of God. Lord, that we wouldn't become so blinded that we only think that it's us and we can only focus right here in our four walls, but God, that we would understand how big this actually is. And Lord, we thank you that we get to be part of that. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. So in this passage, Paul is talking about the Gentiles and he's saying, you used to be far away from God. Uh, that's the language that he uses. Now you are near. All right, like you weren't able to be part of this group. You were excluded. Now, because of Jesus, you've been brought near. You can be part of this. And at the end of the passage, he talks about how together they are the dwelling place of the Lord. And he uses the analogy of a building, the foundation he says, is the apostles and prophets. Jesus is the cornerstone. That's, that's the most important part that everything else is built off of. It's, it's the first starting spot. But then there's this middle chunk of these like three kind of slides, these three paragraphs that we looked at. Uh, and I want us to primarily talk about that today. All right, and it's a spot where Paul is talking about the barrier that used to be between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And, and he says that it caused hostility or animosity uh, between them. And, and he talks about these groups coming together and no longer being separate. And, and this, this is important. And I think that um, in our plain English here, as we read through this, even as I was reading through it this morning right here together, like there's things that seem to be very cut and dry in the English translation that a, as I've kind of dug into this, like it's, it's not quite as cut and dry as what we think. Um, and, and everything that's being said there is true and accurate, um, but I think that we can very easily kind of potentially start to apply it the wrong way. And that's what I want us to look at today. All right, he talks about these groups coming together, uh, and this is, this is important. Um, and it all surrounds what it means to come together. Like, what does, that, what does that mean? For two different groups to come together and become one. All right, and, and what is the thing that is creating hostility between them? Because in English, it looks very clear, especially depending on the translation you read. But in the Greek, it's not quite as, as clear. Um, and so how do you move forward and reconcile this? Uh, and this is where the letter will begin to shift and focus heavy on what would be the main theme of Ephesians, which is unity. Unity is by far the biggest theme through this letter. Uh, and... and how is that lived out while being a multi-ethnic family that has all sorts of different cultures and backgrounds present? So uh, th this is what our focus is today, like this question right here. What does it look like to be part of a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural family of God? Okay? Because for a lot of us, what it looks like is, for, or for a lot of churches nowadays, is we aren't in our own church, a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural church. We gather together with people that are very similar to us. And there might be a church down the road that represents a different ethnicity, or a different generation, or a different culture. But we struggle to bring this together and do this together. And that's, that's what I want us to kind of look at, all right? There's some big movies out right now. Uh, two big movies that have kind of like turned the box office thing around. All right, so there's Barbie and Oppenheimer. Okay, and so maybe maybe you're not aware of these things. Big movies right now. Has anybody had a chance to see either of those? A few of us. Not that many. Wow, okay. All right, so there's Barbie and Oppenheimer that are out. Oppenheimer, if you aren't aware, is about the story of creating the atomic bomb. 
and the guy that kind of was in charge of that and just following that story. Um, and anytime historical or like loosely based on, on historic things like movies come out, uh, people always start to research that a lot more. Like I guarantee over the next six months, there'll probably be like actual documentaries that are coming out nonstop on Netflix and Hulu and whatever else about like the making of the A-bomb because that's just how it works. Hollywood has a big hit and everyone's like, how do we capitalize that? Let's, let's tell this story. Now, if you look into how the A-bomb came about, um, there is something that is called fission, okay? And fission is what creates the atomic bomb. Fission uh, has a simple definition that is the action of dividing or splitting something into two or more parts. So the atomic bomb happens by taking an atom and splitting it, which is not a natural thing. And when you do that, it creates tons and tons of energy. Okay, it actually, like, fission, splitting an atom, it creates about a million times more energy than our typical sources of energy. Like, it's absolutely wild how much uh, it does. Now, fission is one way of making large amounts of energy. Um, now, following the atomic bomb, people started to think, well, what else can we do? Because that's, that's human nature. How do we go bigger? How do we go better? How do we capitalize on this? And they started looking into what was called the hydrogen bomb. And the hydrogen bomb is supposed to be a lot more powerful than the atomic bomb. And, and the reason for that is because the atomic bomb uses fission. The hydrogen bomb would actually use a different scientific term called fusion. Okay? Now, fusion, fission is taking one, splitting it into two or into multi. Fusion is taking two and combining them into one. All right? And with fusion, it actually creates three to four times more than fission. So you're talking three to four million times more energy. Okay, are we following this? You guys are like, wait, when did we move into science class? I'm sorry, but I love this analogy and, and just how it kind of brings things together. So this fusion, it creates even more energy. All right, now think about this with me. Think about our country today. Think about relationships and the way that we interact with people in our country and people that are different from us, okay? Think about the power of division and the power of unity. Both of these things bring about massive influence. Now, right now in our country, it would seem like every single media outlet, every single thing in politics, everything going on in our world is all like using this idea of fission, this idea of division. Okay, and why? Because it gives massive results. Remember, fission gives a million times more. Like now we're talking energy. But I see this, like division. If you want to really gain a following, just start talking about what you are against. And people are going to be like, yeah, I'm with you. I'm against that. Like division brings all sorts of this like influence. And division honestly is easy. It's really easy to do. Splitting people apart is easy. Just highlight what makes them different from each other. And then tell them that that difference matters and that difference is bad. Okay, that, that's how simple division is. And people keep using it because it's working. And then, like, so think about politics. Like, the other side of whatever you are is always going to be painted as, as evil. Like, that's, that's what everyone's going to tell you. And you don't want to be like the other side. And so what happens is both sides get more and more extreme. Because here's the thing, like if, if, if there's a spot and you're standing over here, well, you want to keep moving this way. Because if the other side is evil, to move this way at all is to move closer to evil, right? That's how it works. And so what happens is people begin to um, come against and they begin to like demonize and just talk down about anybody who would be more like the other side than they are. And so what happens is you get more and more extreme, more and more extreme, and you keep going in those directions. And it creates all of this, like there, there is so much money today in the idea of division that is in our country. All right, like division, this idea of splitting things apart, it carries so much influence. Now, what I hope happens down the road is that our world and culture begin to realize that, yeah, there might be a lot of influence and energy and, and, and money even in division, but there's something that is actually even more powerful than that, and that's, that's unity. When people come together, like think about any time something big happens and everyone can, can draw together on that. 
Okay, so some of you guys are going to be too young to, like, remember this, but, like, think back to when, when 9-11 happened. You know, think about the, the weeks, the days, the weeks, the months that followed that. There wasn't a whole lot of talk of division. There wasn't a whole lot of talk of, of this and that. It was, it was together. There was this unity that was there that was so inc- incredibly strong. Now, Paul, here, in this verse, he's, he's looking at things and saying, hey, for a long time, what drove the Jewish people forward, what drove them into devotion to Yahweh and to their Lord, actually, in a way, was sort of like division. The Mosaic Covenant, the laws, the Old Testament, okay, that they practiced, it was, it was there to set them apart from the rest of the world. It literally was this, like, hedge around them that divided them and set them apart from the rest of the world. And this idea of being different, which we can use to term division, it drove them forward. Like, we are more, we are going to be closer to Yahweh. This is, we are closer to our God. Look at the rest of the world and the way they are. Look at the way we are. There is this division that is there. And, and now here's the thing. Like, it was made with good intentions, it was. It was God was saying, like, if you live this way, you are going to draw closer to me. If you live this way. And it was a good thing in the short run, but in the long run, they weren't able to follow the law. And what God made for good ended up getting twisted. Last week we said that sinful nature takes what God has created for good and it twists it. And when it's twisted, it begins to draw people away from God instead of towards God. And so what God intended for good with the law became twisted over time and began to draw people away from God instead of closer to him. It even began to divide division between the Jewish people with each other because it was this measuring stick. Look how good I am compared to how good you are. I follow the law more than you do. And so what God had intended to draw this group together and draw him, draw them into himself, began to actually divide. And when that happened, it moved them further from the world as well. It's interesting, in, in, in Deuteronomy, when you, when you look at that, there's these blessings that God says, when you follow what I've laid out for you, these blessings will happen in your life. And then he says, when you don't follow it, these curses will happen. And so don't think like God is like, Casting a curse on them. It's just blessing and curse is kind of like the language that's used of like, here's the results. Here's the good results when you do what you're supposed to. Here's the bad results when you don't. It's ramifications. All right? And the curse, when you, when you read about this, when, when God says, when you don't follow my laws, oftentimes what it points to is it actually says there is going to be division between you and the other nations. Go read this in Deuteronomy. Go to the end of Moses' speech. And he's saying, if all these things happen, if you don't do what you're supposed to, then this is going to happen with the foreign nations around you. And there's going to be division that is created. Almost always, their disobedience results in hostility with other nations. Like that is what God says will happen when they disobey. And so that's the idea of curses, okay? So the law itself, the law itself wasn't necessarily bad. But the fact that they couldn't keep the laws resulted in these bad things. And their sinful nature took and twisted the good law and turned it into this measuring stick. All right, so it creates division among everybody. They were set apart from the world, but it wasn't in a good way anymore. It wasn't like, here's the example of how you're supposed to live. Instead, it was often this attitude of like, I am holier than you. And and we know that that attitude still persists today. We probably all know somebody who thinks that they're better than everybody else. Whether that's another Christian that thinks that they're better or it's just somebody else. And all of that is division based. What Paul starts talking about here is coming together. And he says, hey, living according to the law was a million times better than not having the law. But the law was a source of division and there's actually a better way that isn't just a million times better. It's four million times better. That's because it brings us together. It's this idea of unity. All right, all this is pretty good, and it's the basic reading of this section. All right, that we aren't supposed to be divided. We're supposed to come together. We see that. All right? 
And I think that we can understand that division gets people um, amped up, and, and we don't need a science lesson for that. I'm going to stop using that analogy because I actually think right there, this is where this idea of fission and fusion breaks down, is as we move into what I think Paul's actually trying to say here. All right, because it, that, that analogy falls short. Right now, when we think about the basic way we translate this, this is kind of what I thought as I was reading this. Track with me here. Is this what you think as we read through our passage today? Okay, it sounds like what we're saying is that the law, the law is bad. We need to go a different route. The problem is the law, but, but the law was part of being Jewish, all right? Like it was part of their identity. And so to get rid of the law means to get rid of, of Jewishness, to get rid of the things that made them what they were. You know, or for the other side, to get rid of what made you Gentile and your background, get rid of all of that, coming together as one group, you know, what Paul is advocating for, when we think of it that way, it means leaving everything else behind. You get rid of everything else, and instead, you're just coming together as one group. And, and I don't think that's what Paul is actually trying to say here. I think he's saying you need to come together as one group, but this idea of losing everything that defines you, I don't think that that's what he's want. This idea of like, everything else is gone, now we are all just citizens of God's kingdom. We are Christians and that's it. Everything else is gone. I don't think that that's what Paul is, is trying to say here. Is that kind of the, the idea that when you read through Ephesians 2 here, is that what you would have gotten as you read through that? Like, okay, get rid of all this, just come together, we're Christians now. All right? And, and so that idea would be this, this thing where you have, you have Jewish people, you have Gentiles, and that's kind of called the third race. You have this, okay, we are followers of God, and that's what we are defined by. We are not defined by these things anymore. We are only defined by this. And I think oftentimes that's the, the traditional way of, of reading this passage. But I don't think that's what Paul is trying to get at here. The law hasn't divided people. The hostility that comes from the Jews not being able to keep the law and the law being a source of superiority, sinful nature, is what is dividing people. If Paul thought the law was bad, then why would he continue to talk about it and quote it a couple of chapters later in Ephesians? He actually says, hey, children, obey your parents. It's the first commandment with a promise that you will live a long life. Okay, that's part of the law. If the law was dividing people, why would Paul turn around and use the law as something to, to encourage them with? Chapter 6 opens with that. So I don't think Paul's trying to get rid of the law. He also talks about getting rid of the old way of living. But what's interesting here is he doesn't talk about this with the Jewish people. He actually talks about that with Gentiles. Not the Jews and the law. So if Paul isn't advocating for this idea where everything else is washed away that defines us, and we are now this new like race of Christians, all right, like what is he saying? What is he saying when he says, okay, the two groups need to become one. We need to stop defining ourselves in that way and this way, and we need to become one. Well, where have we heard that language before? Where have you heard that two become one? Like, think about this. If, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard Genesis 2 written out. And actually, Paul even quotes Genesis 2 in this line later in Ephesians. It's this idea of a husband and a wife becoming one. Okay, but think about that. Think about this idea. When I was a youth pastor, we always had kids that were dating each other. It's like the worst part of the job. Oh, man. The amount of times I'm like, please don't. This is not going to end well. They never listen. When you have a couple that starts dating, and they no longer have an individual identity. And now all they are defined by is this relationship. And even if that moves into marriage, maybe you can think of somebody that you know like this, where that couple, whether they're married, whether they're dating, engaged, doesn't matter, they, they have no identity in and of themselves. This couple is now their entire identity. When we look at that, do we think that's healthy? No, most of us would say, that's, that's not healthy. You should still have your own individual. Well, hold on, hold on. Genesis said that two will become one. 
So we can see that this phrasing, this idea of two becoming one, there's some nuance to it here. Because we know that that isn't exactly what is being meant. So when we take that same phrasing, because we interpret the Bible through the Bible, right? We always have to remember that. When we see a phrase, if it's from somewhere else in Scripture, we should immediately start thinking about that. And, and it can't be true here and not true here. Like, they have, to, they have to be able to work together. So this language of two becoming one, I don't think it's meant to say that you lose everything about yourself. That you now are no longer Jew, you're no longer Gentile, you're just followers of Jesus. You know, as they, as they would refer to themselves as the way. I don't think that that's fully what's meant to happen here. I think we are meant to keep our own individual identity. All right, like I am still Josiah, my wife is still Emily. We are not Gemily or something like that. You know, everyone comes up with their favorite, like, smash the names together for, for uh, famous couples, you know, celebrities. We have our own identities. So it isn't a stretch here to say that when Paul says these two groups, Jews and Gentiles, which by the way is the entire world, because Gentile just means you're not Jewish. So that's everybody. Either you're Jewish or you're not. When these two groups come together, I don't think he's meaning to say, lose everything about yourself. You are now just this. I think a better analogy here, this is where fusion breaks down. Because fusion brings two together and it, it does join them together. A better idea is this. Composite materials. Think about this. Fiberglass, concrete. You take multiple pieces, two different things, you put them together into one, and that composite material now combines the strengths of the two. They don't blend together. Composite materials, you still can in a way kind of break them apart, depending on what it is, but they, they are not fused together. They are not melted together and now one thing. They still are the two together. The oldest composite material probably would be this, mud bricks. I go all the way back to Exodus, the Israelites making things for the Egyptians. Remember, they said, you have to go get your own straw now. We're not going to give it to you. They were mixing mud and straw. Why? Because straw, when you grab it, if you try and like pull it this way, it's super strong and it's, it's bendable. But if you take straw and you crumple it up and smash it, it's just going to, it's going to go to dust. Like, it's just not going to, it's not going to hold. Now, mud, on the other hand, mud, if you try and, like, compact mud, like, it's incredibly strong. But if you have dried mud and you go to bend it, what's going to happen? It breaks really fast. Now, you combine straw and mud together, and you get the strength of both of them. Mud bricks now have a little bit of bend to them, and they aren't going to break. The straw can't be crushed up because the mud is going to protect it. It takes the two strengths of these two things and it puts them together and it enhances each other. And it actually offsets each other's weaknesses. So when Paul is talking about this idea, Paul is telling these two groups here to come together into one, but not in a way that eliminates their identity, who they are, their background, their strengths, or their differences. And if you, think, if you think that you all have to be the same, if we think that when we walk into church here, all of us have to be the same, then whenever you see differences, you're going to see that as a weakness and it's something you have to overcome and it's going to be a source of division. I'm different from you. One of us must be right. That's something we have to figure out here. It, it creates division. And I know that Paul was not trying to advocate that they remove what made them different from each other. I know he isn't saying having differences causes you to be weak. He says when you come together and live in unity, it shows the powers of this world that they no longer have power over us. He says this in the next chapter, next week. We'll look at this, Ephesians 3, verse 10. It says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. He will display the church with its rich variety and show the unseen rulers, you don't control this. Because what you control, when there's differences, it creates division. 
But what God controls, when there's differences, it creates strength. That's what's going to show the world that you are mine. That's what's going to show the world that the world doesn't have power. What you intended to divide, God intended to unite. All those differences that, that want to pull people apart, it's going to instead pull them together with more strength than you could ever imagine. Why don't we do this? Why don't we stand together as we kind of bring this to a close? All of this so far, you're probably like, okay, what is going on here? Why do I need to know any of this? I think it's incredibly important for us to, to have the, the right outlook of what makes us different. What is our church supposed to do with this? If Paul is advocating for the body of Christ to be culturally and ethnically diverse and to keep the pieces that make it diverse, then this should change how we approach church. All right, and and so we've talked about this before. At our church here, we are a church with diverse belief backgrounds. All right, now... A couple months ago, we talked about this idea, what truly makes you a Christian, that core, those core beliefs. All right, and our hope is that all of us would land within this, this circle of these core beliefs. That's what makes us Christian. But then as you move out, you have these other circles, and those things may be what lands you in a specific denomination or how you view church should be done. And, and we keep having these, these different circles And every one of those, they they should get a little less important. And on the outside, we have just purely opinions. How we do this, what time the service is at, how long the service goes, whether kids stay in the service or not, what color is the carpet. All of these things, they have complete opinion, outermost circle. Not at all part of being a Christian. And yet so many people, that is where they make the decision of what church they want to be part of. You know, something like that or some of the practical side of things. Now, as a church here, we have diverse backgrounds. I know this. I I have talked with so many people in our church. We have people that are coming from all different backgrounds. Okay, some that grew up in a church that would be in a denomination like ours. Okay, we have people that that in their life, they've been part of of Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, Baptist churches. They they have been Amish and no longer are. They've been Mennonite. They've been uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness. Like, I'm telling you, we have people from all different backgrounds. And now we need to land on that core piece that matters. Without that, I don't think you can have unity. You can't just take complete differences and make unity. But everything else there, we need to be willing to let those things become a strength instead of a source of division. And we talk about it. Pastor Aaron, I absolutely, she is amazing. I know that we have people that that either struggle with or don't know what to to do with the idea of having a a pastor that is a female because of the background of where they come from. And yet, I've seen nothing but absolute respect and love for Pastor Aaron out of our church. You know how amazing that is? That we have differences and we don't let those rule us. We're diverse in our ages. We're diverse in our backgrounds. Now, something that we aren't really a whole lot, but we've said this is the vision of our church and we are moving towards is being diverse in our cultures and diverse in our ethnicities because our community absolutely is. And a healthy church should look like its community. If we are truly reaching our community, if we are doing what we are called to do, we should look like our community. This should be a cross section. You can take a cut out of our church and say, this should be representative of our community. And so we have a vision. We want to move in this direction. This is, and, and I wanted to go into this and I'm just not going to. There's no time for it today. We, we, have, we have done a massive disservice when we boil this down to the idea of like race and skin color and physically what we look like. 
Okay, ethnicity does not always mean that, and, and cultures does not mean that. And like, so what we need to do is we need to be a church that, that absolutely, like, we are diverse, and that diversity gives us strength. Okay, and so, so here's, here's kind of just a very simple statement. Cultural differences should be a source of enrichment and strength, not division. And my hope is, is that just like straw and mud, as our diverse church comes together, that we will begin to enhance each other's strengths and learn from each other. And that we will offset each other's weaknesses. I know that if, if you live in Long Prairie, like you, you, you see this every single day. And it, I struggle with the fact that I don't get to see that on Sunday. And when we come together, it shouldn't be about erasing what makes each one of us unique. We shouldn't try and cover up our differences. We shouldn't be saying, don't focus on the fact that we have different cultures, different expectations. You know, just pretend like none of those, you know, matters. All that matters is that we're all Christians. Now, I think it does matter that we have differences. And that we allow those differences to shine through. We should be embracing them. It should enhance our church. They should point to the world that God is doing something here. Because here's the thing, like race and ethnicity are so complicated because we've, we've reduced it, you know, primarily down to like just physical attributes. You know, but that, that's how the power of the world would do it. True diversity in the body of Christ is less about skin color, more about the differences in customs, practices, traditions, languages. All right, and, and unity in that kind of diversity is almost impossible. It is which is what makes it so remarkable when it happens and why it has to come through the working of the Holy Spirit. We can't do that on our own. And so here's my challenge for us today. My challenge is to begin to see strengths in cultures that are different from yours. I'm going really practical with this. Could you... Could you list off three or four things? Like right now, begin to think about a culture that is different than yours. Preferably one that maybe you interact with at various times. Think about how you would describe that culture. If you were talking to someone else, what things would you say, this is how I describe that culture? All right, now could you list three or four things about another culture than yours, whatever that is, can you list three or four things that you see as strengths? That you're like, man, I wish, I wish that, that my culture had that. I wish my culture looked like this. Can you think of like strengths, three or four of them, that you admire and you wish were present in your life? Now, second part, think about your own culture. And if you are describing your culture to somebody else, what are some weaknesses of your own? Because as we do this, and as we begin to understand that we have weaknesses, we have strengths, it allows us to come together and to let those strengths kind of come to the surface and to say, hey, I'm weak in this area. But you know what? You can help me offset that. And this, I think, is the picture that Paul is trying to say when he says, these two groups are going to become one. Not that we're going to lose everything that makes them unique. We're not going to just kind of have this like idea of like, oh, I don't see any of that. We're just all Christians. Yay. No, we're going to allow those things to actually come through. Be very present. And we're going to allow it to strengthen us. Because being part of a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural church should not erase our differences, but instead celebrate them in a way that enhances us. And we should be better because of them. So I want to pray. I want you to think about this, process this. What does this look like? And and move, move beyond just like cultural differences, ethnic differences. Just think about this as a whole. Differences. In this church, or maybe you're from another church and you're visiting here today, think about it in your church. 
How can that bring strength? Jesus, we pray right now, Lord, that that what normally would cause division in our world would instead enhance this community. God, that it would draw us closer to you. God, I pray that this community would be able to be an example to the greater community that's around us. God, I pray that when we are spending time with people and they're pointing out potentially flaws or things that they don't like about somebody else who's different from them, Lord, in whatever way, if that means politically, God, or it means the age and the generation that they're part of, God, culturally, whatever it is, Lord, that we would be able to to just kind of even snap back in that moment and talk about the strengths that we see instead of falling in line and just kind of agreeing with people. Oh, yeah, those differences are so hard. God, let us be different. Let us be an example to this world of what your spirit can do when it's inside of us. So God, we we ask this. Lord, we pray that as we move forward here that we would begin to just look like our community in so many different ways. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen.